Borrelli biofilms dwell inside Alzheimer amyloid plaques. Uh, this lecture reviews the results of a hundred consecutive plaques examined by me. Alzheimer plaques in medical teaching over 50 years have uh, instructed us that the plaques shown to the right in black and brown are dead regions and all remaining tissue that's not black is either alive or possibly wounded but not yet dead. There are uh, several take-home messages from this research. The most important is that uh, there is a life inside Alzheimer plaques that the uh, plaques have living elements. Uh, it certainly is true that amyloid is present in Alzheimer plaques. That doesn't change. Uh, but in addition, DNA stains have shown that uh, Borrelia amyloid in biofilm form is identified inside the plaques. Uh, the DNA probes used to establish this are, are probes that recognize Borrelia miyamotoi uh, DNA only and do not bind to any human DNA or to the DNA of any other microbe. Borrelia biofilm communities are alive and this uh, research has shown that they fill the entire plaque. They're not uh, small little dots, uh, but they are uh, filling the entire substance of the Alzheimer plaque. 100 Alzheimer plaques they are examined uh, as stained by amyloid, the traditional method. Uh, the plaques are then uh, illuminated with special light to show whether any of the biofilm has bound the DNA probes that are unique for the Borrelia. Um, Borrelia is present in uh, biofilm form in 100 plaques studied. Living biofilm communities unlock many secrets about the uh, biology and the life history of Alzheimer plaques. Why do plaques begin as small entities and terminate as large structures? Question mark. Why do plaques have empty spaces? Uh, that's been established in many uh, reconstructions uh, of Alzheimer plaques stained with amyloid. Why are the empty spaces in a network-like arrangement? Why do they interconnect? Uh, the number of plaques per unit area and Alzheimer's disease increases over time with the course of disease advancing from early to death. Uh, why do plaques in early Alzheimer's disease show up at the base of the brain only and at the end of the uh, disease, at the time of death, the plaques have spread to all gray matter regions compromising neural function. Uh, so we have the dogma of Alzheimer plaques as dead zone uh, that dogma is now uh, changed. Uh, certainly areas of injury in brain tissue uh, by Alzheimer's disease are in part represented by what's going on in the plaques and it is in part recognized by what's going on elsewhere in the brain. Uh, beta amyloid has been the uh, subject of study for many many years since the amyloid hypothesis was co coined by Dr. George Glenner uh, in the 80s. A specific uh, beta amyloid 142 has been a, a special area of intense investigation. Other amyloids have been uh, investigated. Uh, millions of dollars spent in research. Uh, pharmaceutical companies developing drugs to try to remove amyloid. Uh, all of this based on the dogma that amyloid is toxic and uh, the toxic amyloid produces the disease. This toxic amyloid idea has been disputed by senior Alzheimer uh, researchers uh, from the tau camp, the uh, tauopathy camp, and not everyone in senior research Alzheimer's disease academic centers believes in the amyloid hypothesis of toxic amyloid doing the damage causing the disease. My first image of infection inside an Alzheimer plaque came in 2006 
in the case of Mr. Paul Christensen, uh, with the permission of Mr. Christensen's widow, uh, we can talk about the case using his name and showing the images that we uh, derived from the study of his tissue. Uh, he started with evidence of Borrelia in spinal fluid uh, seven or so years before he died. Uh, this was a diagnosis made by Western Blot at Stony Brook uh, in the medical school. Uh, it satisfied CDC criteria. Uh, the levels of antibodies were high, the bands were dark, and uh, he was treated for uh, Borrelia infection uh, without benefit. Uh, he got high dose uh, IV therapy. Uh, his disease progressed from his initial atypical pa facial pain symptom uh, to uh, issues of memory problems and uh, uh, progression to dementia. He had a uh, further onset of brain damage by uh, development of hydrocephalus, which is water in the brain. He had a shunt placed inside his brain to remove the pressure. Uh, that shunt was infected. Uh, and the shunt did not help uh, in his uh, neurologic uh, status. He, uh, at the end, developed paranoid behavior, was out of control, couldn't be cared for by his loving family in his home anymore, had to go to a uh, nursing facility, and he died there. The family requested an autopsy. His autopsy showed Alzheimer's disease by standard criteria. This was performed at the medical school pathology, neuropathology <coughs> division, and all of the key features of Alzheimer's disease were established. His stage was BRAC number six, which is the most advanced form of Alzheimer's disease. So within this plaque, using DNA probes uh, that were unique to bind to DNA of Borrelia burgdorferi flagellin, uh, the plaque lights, lights up the uh, marker on the DNA probe is green, it's fluorescein, uh, it's very bright, it has sharp borders, uh, the uh, brain around it is dark black, and inside the plaque there are dark black areas, uh, which are holes or voids, which are expected in Alzheimer plaques. Um, <clears throat> they are also expected in biofilm communities. We'll explain these dark black regions uh, in a minute. In another case of Alzheimer's disease, we um, did a panel of stains. First, we did DNA probes for Borrelia miyamotoi. So this is a different uh, Borrelia uh, carried by ticks. Uh, the miyamotoi Borrelia DNA probe is red instead of green. The panel in the center shows the uh, signals from the DNA probe bound to the DNA in the plaque, and you can see that it's uh, either white and bright in intensity or red and bright in intensity. Uh, it uh, forms a series of dot-like structures. These are closely grouped, and some of them actually overlap. Uh, to the right of the center, figure 6G shows a biofilm, and that has uh, bright intensity, uh, living uh, membrane-bound, DNA uh, structures, uh, granular amyloid, uh, granular, I mean, uh, granular Borrelia within an amyloid plaque, and uh, red dark material, which is outside the membrane bound region, but it is uh, surrounding all of the elements of the biofilm, and it's the extracellular matrix. So we have all of the key features of biofilm inside and uh, entity called the biofilm community, and this biofilm community resides inside the red amyloid plaques. Each and every one of them had a biofilm community. Biofilms are a marker of chronic inflammation. Biofilms are the concept of Bo Dr. Bill Costerson, and uh, biofilms has a special biology which may be new to microbiology students. We'll get into that biology in a minute. It's an important uh, manifestation of bacterial survival in adverse conditions. It involves a number of changes 
in the bacteria uh, to form the biofilm community, and we'll see those in detail. So uh, here's a biofilm to the right. What is a biofilm? Uh, it is a, a collection of living uh, microbes. The microbes undergo specialization. So the way they start out on a bacteriology plate differs from the way they wind up in living form inside the biofilm community. Uh, in Borrelia, uh, the uh, most easily recognized form is the spiral form. In the specialized form, which uh, is needed to uh, have a life in the uh, biofilm community, the uh, spiral forms are lost and they are replaced by living granular forms. We'll show evidence why these living granular forms appear as dots rather than spirals and that they have membrane material surrounding uh, DNA and they are living entities which are capable of reproducing the spiral form. But for the time being, let's just understand that uh, biofilms are different under the microscope. They have a different function, a role to protect and preserve in adverse conditions. So many teachable moments uh, here. Some of the essential ones, specialized Borrelia, that's granular Borrelia, inside a biofilm community. Small dot-like profiles, now spirals legitimate living viral uh, Borrelia uh, forms. These are called granular forms. Each of the granules are membrane bound. They contain DNA. Uh, they are life forms. They are living. They are able to grow and increase in number over the lifetime of the uh, biofilm. DNA and RNA show bright signal uh, in the uh, granulars, uh, the granular Borrelia. DNA probes establish these bright signals by binding to the DNA uniquely. Uh, there is a growth of the granules in the biofilm community over time. They increase in number, they increase in size. The biofilm in, uh, in, itself increases in size. And uh, the matrix which uh, supports and invests the gel-like matrix uh, protecting the biofilm community also grows and it increases over time. Matrix uh, key points, it's a surround. A surround is a structure, a biological structure, which uh, separates uh, the biofilm from the external environment. It is separate and uh, it is uh, distinct from the membrane bound uh, bright signal, white to red Borrelia, as we've shown earlier. Its composition includes extracellular DNA, so it's not bound inside membranes. It's free DNA in the extracellular matrix. Also, proteins are present and other, other constituents. It originates from members of the biofilm community that were once living but are now dead. And they've contributed uh, their bodies to produce the viscous matrix. In mature forms, it's traversed by water channels. These are empty spaces in a network. Uh, they conduct uh, nutrition uh, to nurture, uh, to nurture uh, the uh, members of the living community inside the biofilm. And they also provide uh, sewer conduits, waste uh, channels to remove uh, waste material from the living community. It supports, it protects, it insulates the community. In a test tube, we can grow Borrelia biofilms. And here, a black and white uh, side by side with Cyto Viva advanced optics. Uh, the uh, green and uh, red panel is what we'll focus on. You'll see very uh, distinctly that there are spiral Borrelia. Uh, these are at the edge of the biofilm. Uh, they do not make it into the center of the biofilm. Uh, they contain membrane-bound DNA. They're living and uh, they're vital. Uh, the spirals then have a transformation where they break up into little dots. Each of the little dots has a membrane and it surrounds uh, DNA. The uh, granular dot-like forms are vital capable of growth, capable of re 
generating the entire spiral under the right conditions. In uh, this panel, the uh, extracellular matrix is in green, and uh, that's what is insulating and supporting and uh, advancing the cause of the biofilm community. It creates a boundary between the internal living biofilm community and the external environment. Uh, for those of you who look carefully, you can see that areas of green are interrupted by areas of gray to blue, and those are the water channels, the spaces which provide nutrition and waste product removal. We'll see these in greater detail in a minute. This is a uh, biofilm in a test tube. Uh, the spiral forms around the edge. Uh, as you get towards the center, it's all granular Borrelia, all surrounded by a biofilm matrix, investing and supporting the community. Now, granular infection, uh, we could call them granular infectomes, uh, malaria. Malaria has small granules as part of its life cycle. These are called merozoites. They're barely visible. Uh, these little dots have all the DNA membrane bound to regenerate the rings of malaria, the schizonts, uh, the gametocytes, and all the stages of malaria. So as part of the life cycle, granules are important. Uh, in the panel below in blue and white, you can see Treponema pallidum, and you can see spiral forms at the top. And then over time, you can see a transformation to forms that are not spiral anymore. Uh, some of them are ring forms in the center line panels. And then at the bottom, there are a series of dots. Those are the granular treponemes. Uh, spiral uh, forms have been replaced by dot-like forms of membrane-bound DNA. And each of the granular treponemes can regenerate the entire spiral form at the top. Lastly, the black and white image of uh, the left panel shows an autopsy fingerprint preparation from an Alzheimer frontal lobe, uh, year 1986. I'm using here monoclonal antibodies, not DNA probes. Monoclonal antibodies will bind Borrelia burgdorferi DNA. And you can see that there is a dot uh, arrangement, uh, which when you connect the dots, uh, shows the profile of the spirochete from which the dots evolved. Uh, you must connect the dots to get it. Membrane-bound uh, Borrelia. How can we prove that? Well, we did. Uh, I sent uh, a specimen to Dr. Willie Bergdorfer's lab, <clears throat> and under 126,000 magnification with electron microscopy, uh, the granules then showed membrane surrounding the granular elements. The granular elements have a structure and a little higher power shows that the granular elements do indeed have membrane surrounding them. Uh, DNA inside the granular Borrelia. Well, how do we prove that? We've relied on the results of Professor Dr. Claude Garon, again at the Rocky Mountain Laboratory. He broke open uh, these forms and he used special stains and electron microscopy to take uh, micrographs, photomicro electromicrographs of individual DNA molecules. Uh, you can see the molecules in C and the molecules with the blue arrows. They are distinct, they are DNA, and uh, they are found inside the granules of uh, Borrelia. Rocky Mountain Lab again coming to give us information. Granular Borrelia alive. Well, in order to show they're alive, uh, it would be helpful if we could show that the granules regenerate spiral forms. Here is an example of granules A and B uh, in culture over a period of time, and from them sprout small, minute uh, spiral Borrelia. So here we have a pure culture of Borrelia in granular form which over time produces spiral Borrelia. So they're alive and they can regenerate the spiral. Uh, further evidence that granules are important is uh, from a skin biopsy study that Dr. Bernard Berger and I did in Southampton in the 1980s. Uh, we had a pure culture of Borrelia 
and in many cases of uh, erythema migrans, uh, we are able to grow Borrelia in pure form. This is an example of what they look like under the microscope. Uh, this case shows uh, fat spirals, uh, thin spirals, and then it shows dot-like forms. These are the granular form of Borrelia. If you connect the dots, you then have the picture of the spirochete which produced the dots. The dots are the granular form. They're living. Uh, they came from erythema migraine skin. They stain with Borrelia monoclonal antibody 5332. They are the real deal. They are pure granular Borrelia from an erythema migraine skin biopsy. This is a higher picture of a uh, past image showing a closer view of the granular forms. You must connect the dots to identify that they emerged from a spiral Borrelia. Uh, this spiral film in a test tube uh, grown by me uh, was a phase contrast microscopy uh, studied and you can see that uh, there's abundant granules in all of the images. Uh, some of them have spiral uh, uh, forms that you can vaguely discern at the edge, especially in the center panel, but the spirals don't move into the center of the biofilm plaque. Uh, prominent in these um, uh, are the uh, cystic forms, the large, round, bubble-like structures. Those are cystic Borrelia. Those are also living. They contain DNA. Uh, they can regenerate the spiral form uh, under the appropriate conditions. So we return to our topic, granular Borrelia biofilms inside, alive inside Alzheimer amyloid plaques. Uh, the images uh, will have labels A and label B. Label A will always be to the left. It will always be an amyloid stain only. Uh, the stain may be Congo red, which is red uh, with polarized light. Uh, we'll have some uh, green highlights. Uh, a second separate amyloid stain is the thioflavin T green stain. Uh, that will also appear to the left, labeled A. So you will notice uh, two possible colors for amyloid in the left panel A images. To the right will be uh, B, uh, and that will be B for biofilm, or B for Borrelia, granular Borrelia. <clears throat> in B, you'll see round dots that may be either intense white signal or intense red signal. This is membrane bound DNA. In between the bright signal uh, red or white dots, you'll see extracellular DNA, which stains dark red, but does not have um, the uh, profile of the granular Borrelia. It's extracellular DNA derived from once living, now dead Borrelia. All of these combine to form a biofilm. You must have the living elements supported by the matrix, which protects it. Here's our first panel, A and B, uh, amyloid to the left, biofilm to the right. Amyloid pictures obtained by using white light, polarized light, to show the colors of the Congo red, red and green and orange. It has a sharp border. It has a definite external boundary. It has an external profile that's somewhat irregular, but sharply demarcated from the adjacent brain tissue, which is in green. Uh, panel B, uh, the white light is turned off. The red light, monochromatic light, to excite the DNA probe label, which is CY3. Uh, the red label then shows the DNA that has bound the DNA probe, <clears throat> and uh, you can see intense white signal areas of membrane-bound DNA, and then dark red areas of extracellular DNA of the matrix. Uh, here's an amyloid stain in green, uh, and its uh, counterpart, the uh, exact uh, field of view frame of focus, uh, no changes between A and B. Uh, the uh, DNA probes now light up as red, uh, with intense white fluorescence inside the living membrane-bound uh, granular Borrelia. 
it's interesting there's a cylindrical Borrelia at the arrow in A and in B. So you may occasionally see a cylinder at the edge of a biofilm community in uh, DNA stains and even in amyloid stains. Uh, A and B. Uh, you can see the external periphery for A and uh, B, the geography, the mapping. It's exactly the same. They're superimposable. And inside you can see empty spaces. These are the water channel spaces. The arrows point to them. Internal water channel anatomy, exactly the same in A and B. These are biofilm communities of Borrelia inside an amyloid plaque. A and B, uh, exact match uh, externally and internally. Biofilm on the B side showing many, many granules, not too many water channels, probably none at all, uh, but the anatomy is exactly the same. A and B, Congo red stain, orange and uh, green under polarized white light. Turn off the white light, turn on the red, monochromatic light, and the DNA stain lights up. The uh, white signal high intensity areas are the membrane bound living Borrelia inside this biofilm community. The red is the matrix. So we have a few living um, granular Borrelia in this plane of focus. If we focused up and down, we might see many more. We might see less. But we do see a lot of extracellular matrix DNA. That's the red stuff. That is dark red. A and B. Um, biofilm community uh, with very, very large empty spaces. Uh, amyloid plaque with very, very large empty spaces. The external and internal anatomies match perfectly. They are superimposable. The biofilm fills the amyloid plaque region. A and B. Uh, Congo red stain to uh, panel A left showing with white light and polarization, uh, orange to uh, pale red, and uh, then uh, green staining. This is called birefringence. It's a property of Congo red. It helps us to be sure that we've, we're seeing amyloid. And then in panel B, the white life is extinguished, the red light turned on, and panel B shows the biofilm community with the high signal intensity areas of the membrane-bound living members inside the community and the darker red of the extracellular supporting and protecting matrix. A and B, uh, amyloid in green, uh, biofilm in red to the B side. Notice that the dots in B are reddish, pink to white, high-intensity signal, membrane-bound Borrelia living Borrelia in granular form, and then connecting and surrounding all of these, the protective extracellular matrix in dark red. The anatomy of A and B is a perfect match. A and B, to the left, uh, amyloid stain, Congo red with the birefringence, uh, varying shades of red, and orange, and some green tinges, a polarized white light. Turn off the polarized light. Uh, turn on the red monochromatic light, the CY5 fluorochrome label identifies the DNA probes bound to Biomodoi Borrelia DNA. At 6 o'clock a white uh, bright signal demonstrates that there is uh, in this area membrane bound living uh, DNA in the biofilm community. The rest of it is uh, mostly protective matrix of the uh, once dead living uh, DNA from previous uh, members of the community which contributed their elements to form the protective biofilm. So the experimental methods, <coughs> methods are simple. <clears throat> First an autopsy diagnosis. A conventional autopsy uses the CRAD criteria and immunostainings beta 142 and phosphorylated tau p tau. The report is written. Uh, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's is confirmed. A stage uh, one through six is uh, attached to the diagnosis. 
the uh, material then is filed away, um, never to be seen again. Uh, out of that material, we request that they pull uh, material for recut uh, glass slides. That means we cut deeper into the block from the uh, slides that were prepared and uh, we use hippocampus because that's where most of the exciting action is in Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, the first run is to run molecular beacon DNA probes. They uh, do uh, their work through in situ hybridization. It's called fluorescence in situ hybridization or FISH. This is a standard method. Uh, the probes are annealed to DNA. It has to be a perfect 100% match for the probes to bind. Even one mismatch in one nucleotide will prevent the probes from binding. So all the binding that you've seen by DNA probes in all the previous pictures, all 100% match due to molecular beacon DNA probes. There are other DNA probes that are not beacons, they're linear. Uh, they may hybridize even though the match between the probe and the target is not perfect. Molecular beacon DNA probes only hybridize when the match is 100% perfect. Uh, the last uh, staining step is the amyloid staining step. We use CR, Congo Red, or Thioflavin T. Uh, these then are um, run in parallel with control materials. And uh, in those cold ma control materials, there is no Alzheimer's disease. There is no amyloid staining. Uh, there is no DNA hybridization because there is no Borrelia in the normal controls. Uh, lastly, uh, photomicrographs are obtained from the amyloid plaque under high magnification. Uh, we get the plaque in photographic form. Uh, the microscope is locked. The field of view is locked. The plane of, plane of focus is locked. The white light is turned off. The red light to excite DNA probe uh, fluorescence bound to amyloid uh, members of uh, the biofilm uh, community. Uh, is turned on. It's a special monochromatic red light. We take a picture of B. We uh, then compare side by side the pictures of A and B, and those are the pictures you've seen previously. Uh, we determine whether there is a match, uh, whether there's nothing on the Borrelia DNA side, and then compile the results. The results in this case, of course, 100 consecutive studied Alzheimer amyloid plaques 100 contained biofilms of DNA. The distribution of the DNA in the biofilm exactly the same as the topographies, external and internal, for the amyloid plaques. So live Borrelia inside Borrel biofilm communities has a natural life history. It starts out small, gets bigger, develops prominent water channels or empty spaces. It's very similar to the life history of amyloid plaques. They start out small, they get bigger, they develop empty spaces or black holes. Um, so the uh, developmental landmarks are exactly the same. Conclusion, all amyloid plaques studied in this 100 series, uh, number one, they contain amyloid as expected. Uh, the number two uh, is not expected, and that is that the biofilms of Borrelia DNA fill the amyloid plaque. The DNA of the Borrelia is biofilm DNA. It's living Borrelia, granular form. It's bound by membrane. By electron microscopic proof, membrane surrounds these granules. It has DNA molecules inside the membrane bound granules by electron microscopic proof. These are living Borrelia, granular form Borrelia, sometimes a cylindrical form, but not often, inside the biofilm. And in addition, there is extracellular DNA, not bound by membrane, but diffusely surrounding, investing, protecting the members of the living community. This derives from once living but now dead Borrelia, previously living in the plaque and contributing their constituents to make more protective extracellular matrix material. This, another test tube image of a uh, biofilm plaque raised in the laboratory. This is remarkable for many cystic forms and at six o'clock one 
uh, cell wall deficient L form. <clears throat> so general truths. Biofilms represent a survival adaptation. 99% of microbes on planet Earth do have a biofilm form at some point in their life. This protects them from being extinguished, killed, uh, injured in tissue, uh, not in the wild, but in tissue in the body. Biofilm formation always, and I'll say that again, always indicates chronic infection. Acute infections do not make biofilms. Early biofilms are small in diameter. Late biofilms are large in diameter. So growing over time, plaques increase in size, biofilms increase in size. They're living. They have complexity. They have a definite architecture. And here we have an actual slide from an Alzheimer brain stained with brown material. It might be silver. It might be a brown stain for amyloid beta 142. It might be another brown stain, an amino stain. In any event, the plaques are sharp. They're round. They come in small, medium, and large. They tend to be clustered closely in some areas as they are here in the center. And as you move out to the periphery, they're small, uh, they're widely spaced, and there's lots of brain tissue in between that does not take the stain. So we have the uh, crowded version and the not so crowded version. We have the small version, we have the large version. And by uh, relationship with red arrows, we see that biofilm units come in small, medium, and large. And over time, these small living biofilms grow into large living biofilms. And uh, that explains why we have small, medium, and large plaques with empty spaces uh, in Alzheimer brain tissue. It's a biofilm community. Empty spaces inside of plaques are water channels. That's the scientific name. It provides nutrients. It removes waste. Uh, Empty spaces have uh, the function of a plumbing system for biofilms. Empty spaces or voids also traverse Alzheimer plaques with silver stains or with amyloid stains. Medium and large uh, amyloid plaques tend to have more empty spaces of larger size than smaller plaques. This is the 3D reconstruction of an amyloid Alzheimer plaque. And you can see there are solid areas and there are empty voids. Uh, there are areas that even appear to be breaking off and moving away from the mother load plaque and that perhaps he's going to set up new uh, areas of plaque formation which will then grow into large size and look like the mother uh, plaque shown here in the large image. If we look carefully at the Alzheimer plaque stained with silver or with uh, a brown stain for amyloid with immunoperoxidase, uh, the normal brain around it is yellow and then the plaque stains uh, various uh, shades of brown. If you look carefully within the brown, you'll see spots of yellow. These spots are the holes that go through the plaque. They are windows that enable you to see completely through from the top to the bottom. And at the bottom, you'll see yellow. The yellow is the underlying brain tissue, which is supporting the plaque. So they are windows to look through the plaque from the top to the bottom. There are a fair number of yellow spaces in the Alzheimer plaque. These empty spaces are voids. Uh, for a higher power of view, to see those empty spaces, the yellow spaces, more clearly. Uh, the arrows point them out to you. Uh, this is an amyloid uh, plaque, which uh, was stained with a um, turquoise method. Uh, this is uh, an Alcyon blue modification. And uh, the uh, arrows show the empty spaces, the black holes, the voids. Uh, the, the brain tissue that is uh, around it doesn't stain turquoise. It stains uh, somewhat pink to gray. Uh, at 11 o'clock, there is an arrow showing a black space. And then uh, right adjacent to the black space, a tiny little tinge of uh, pink. And that pink matches the color pink of the uh, adjacent brain tissue at 11 to 12 o'clock. Uh, so that's a window going right through the plaque showing uh, what is an empty space going through the plaque and to reveal the underlying brain tissue. Uh, at 12 o'clock, incidentally, there is a cystic form. That's a cystic Borrelia form, as we have explained earlier. 
water channel formation may form uh, snake-like uh, curly cue uh, plumbing system. Uh, here, a cartoon at one o'clock showing solid areas in uh, a biofilm uh, plaque and then water channels moving through the spaces between the solid areas, almost like toadstools, uh, the solid areas, and then the empty spaces uh, point for circulation of material around the uh, solid areas of the biofilm. Uh, once again, the picture of the internal and external anatomy of biofilm plaques, internal and external anatomy of amyloid uh, plaques, uh, the biofilm then biofilm living community, the amyloid, uh, not alive, just uh, material deposited over the top of the living community. Exactly the same image in each panel, A and B. So our reconstruction 3D, we see the empty spaces, the solid spaces, uh, living Borrelia infection in the human brain. It's chronic, chronic infection. And so uh, chronic equals biofilm equals long-term and long-term infection is what is going on in the uh, dementia here. It takes years for it to develop and that reflects it takes years for the biofilms and the amyloid plaques to reach a critical density where they compromise brain function from memory and other vital functions. Alzheimer described a case, one case, anecdotal. This is the case of Auguste D in 1902. Here's her picture. He studied her while alive, and then she died. He studied her brain. He noticed some abnormal things uh, that were called by him uh, neurofibroid tangles. He was very fascinated by the tangles, and that's what he focused on. He did not call his case Alzheimer's disease. He called it by a case report in German. He had one well worked up case in his whole career. This is an anecdote. Anecdotes in medicine are despised. They prove nothing. Uh, Alzheimer in the end of his life described a second case in less detail and then he died prematurely I think of heart disease. So in his entire career Alzheimer had two cases like Auguste D. Just two. Those are both anecdotes. 100 years elapsed between his death and the reinterest in his work in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, when Alzheimer's disease research took off, it was realized that uh, dementia, senility, was not an inevitable consequence of being old, and that a disease was in play. Alzheimer's uh, neurofibroid tangles uh, here, well established at uh, 7 o'clock, show a dark uh, black uh, neuronal structure filled and choked by the neurofibrillary tangles, their fibers. Uh, they choke out the normal elements, and when they do, the brain uh, cell uh, neuron dies. By comparison, a healthy neuron uh, at uh, the uh, one o'clock position. Uh, we thought at one time they might be the microtubules that had been uh, killed off, and these were corpses of microtubules. Dr. Kidd discovered that uh, the tangles are actually self polymerizing uh, fiber type elements that uh, form inside a disease neuron. Uh, they have a twisted uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, there are two, uh, they are paired in each of the tangles. Uh, and there is internal structure even inside the tangles. Uh, they are not corpses of previous microtubules. They're self-polymerizing elements. They're rich in tau protein. Uh, they form inside the disease neuron. Uh, to review then quickly what Alzheimer had in his paper, at uh, one o'clock we have his uh, neurofibrillary tangles. The other uh, images, uh, at uh, 4 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and uh, 10 o'clock are the silver stain version of the Alzheimer plaques. He noted them. He didn't really think there was much that he was interested in in those uh, rounded uh, black structures. He focused on the neurofibrillary tangles. Indeed, in, to this day, the neurofibrillary tangles are the basis for 
the staging of the degree of advancement of Alzheimer's disease. It's a tangle-based distribution. How far do the tangles get? The farther they get to, from the base of the brain, the more advanced the Alzheimer's is. But in parallel with the tangles uh, is the development of plaques. And you can see it in a panel at uh, 4 to 5 o'clock. There are both plaques and uh, tangle uh, neurons. So they develop in parallel. He emphasized the tangles. Today we're emphasizing the plaques. Uh, to come back to the Christensen case, the infectious case that I found with my DNA probes in 2006, we see th uh, two uh, green stained uh, plaques with the Borrelia burgdorferi, not the Borrelia miomotoi, but Borrelia burgdorferi DNA probe. Uh, staining only the plaques and in the larger plaque panel at uh, five o'clock uh, areas of dark uh, and uh, very bright signal uh, that is the uh, solid area of the plaque uh, biofilm with living elements membrane bound uh, DNA living Borrelia in granular form and then we have the water channels which are the darker spaces uh, in an additional case uh, from the Harvard Brain Bank, I did a fingerprint preparation that's rolling wet, uh, unfixed brain tissue across a glass slide and staining it with a monoclonal antibody. You can see that this is a biofilm again. Uh, it has empty spaces. It has bright signal intensity, uh, lower in signal intensity, green, uh, and it has an irregular craggy border. Uh, it's not perfectly spherical. Uh, the um, 9724 is a specific uh, monoclonal stain developed by Dr. Alan Barber to stain Borrelia species and includes Bergdorferi, Miyamoto, and relapsing fever Borrelia types. Specific monoclonal antibody, but here staining protein, not DNA. To the right, staining DNA and not protein. So different ways of looking at biofilms in Alzheimer brain tissue with protein antibody monoclonals and with DNA probes specific for the DNA of the bug. Now Borrelia to Tangles uh, probably involves the participation of Borrelia that have penetrated inside the neuronal cell. These are my images from the late 80s uh, fingerprint preparations from the Harvard Brain Bank. Uh, the uh, neurons are single cells. Inside the neurons are snake-like portions of green material, those are the Borrelia that have gotten inside the neuron, the nucleus of the neuron uh, in yellow, the uh, Borrelia in green, and then the speckled cytoplasm uh, is the rest of the picture. When Borrelia gets inside the nerve cell, it corrupts the biochemistry. The corruption of the biochemistry leads to the phosphorylation of tau protein. Tau protein is present in the cell before the infection as a healthy form. After the infection has established itself, tau protein becomes an unhealthy form. It's modified chemically, phosphate is added, it becomes phosphorylated tau. Phosphorylated tau does the damage inside the neuron, which precedes the formation of the neurofibrillary tangles. These are self-polymerizing elements, fibers twisted, as Dr. Kidd has shown us, that develop and choke out the entire contents of the healthy neuron. Uh, a uh, Living Good and Gilmore paper, uh, here are the images from nerve cells in cell culture mixed with living Borrelia. Well, the living Borrelia stick to the outside of the individual nerve cells. You can see them in green, yellow, and uh, the neuron stain and uh, speckled green, orange, or red. Uh, the Borrelia definitely stick to the outside of the nerve cells in culture, the human neuron uh, cells in culture. Uh, this panel shows a progression of uh, Borrelia stuck to the outside of a nerve cell and panels J and K. The Borrelia on the outside stains either red or green. And in panel L, we can see that it, a yellow Borrelia uh, informs us that it has penetrated from the outside of the neuron to the inside. The green uh, stuck to the outside Borrelia is still there. 
the yellow uh, has uh, reached the inside. If you look carefully, the yellow at 12 o'clock has a tiny little strip of green, so part of it is still outside the neuron, and it's wheedled its way inside. The uh, circular black area is the nucleus of the cell. Speckled green is the cytoplasm of the cell. So Borrelia accesses uh, and invades the human neuron. Uh, this is their paper, Invasion of Human Neuronal and Glial Cells by an Infectious Strain of Borrelia burgdorferi, Centers for Disease Control, Fort Collins, Colorado, publication year 2006. Uh, when the tangles become injured, uh, when the uh, tangles begin to form, the microtubular uh, structure, which is healthy, uh, becomes destroyed. So at 12 o'clock, a healthy microtubule and the green worm-like things are healthy tau protein. It stabilizes the uh, molecules of the healthy microtubule. When it is damaged, the healthy tau then detaches from its site and the microtubule uh, comes unglued and becomes destroyed. The tau, which is now damaged and phosphorylated, tends to aggregate and form clumps here in the four o'clock uh, cartoon showing the blue worms are now all collect corrected, connected into a grouping and it's surrounded by a uh, green color to accentuate this abnormal grouping. Uh, when this happens, the neuron is labeled for death. So healthy tau, all of us have it. Phosphorylated tau, Alzheimer's patients have it. We do not have it as healthy people. Uh, I'm going to talk now about infections crossing synapses. And this is a uh, prelude to a discussion of how Alzheimer's uh, moves from early stage to late stage and death. Herpes zoster is a viral infection. Uh, those of us who are old enough to remember got it when we were five years old. If we live to the age of uh, 60, 70, 80, we're at risk for shingles. Shingles is herpes is zoster. It's the same virus. It's been living in the body, uh, uh, in the body for 50 to 80 years in the dorsal root ganglion. It reactivates for uncertain reasons in some people. Not everybody gets zoster. But well, those who do get zoster get weeping, painful ulcers, uh, and they march down the nerve. And as they move along and uh, involve areas of the distribution of the nerve, uh, they produce painful red weeping blisters, uh, which the pain may continue for months after the acute infection. Uh, it is an intraneuronal uh, infection. It moves inside the nerve. It moves down neural pathways inside nerves. It jumps across synapses. So infections can jump across synapses and go through neural networks from nerve to nerve to nerve, jumping across the synapse to reach the next nerve and infect it. Uh, I wrote a paper on Alzheimer's neuroborreliosis, uh, that's a Borrelia infection of Alzheimer brain, with transsynaptic spread of infection and neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, those tangles are the black uh, things that uh, form the carrot-like disease neurons of Alzheimer. Showed them earlier. From intraneuronal spirochetes, that's spirochetes inside neurons. I've shown those too, and Liv and Gil and Gilmore also have shown them. You can read the paper if you like. It was published in 2006. Uh, that is uh, nine years ago. Uh, here's the earliest stage then of uh, the Alzheimer's disease in the left panel. This is uh, infection marked by the dark brown stripes. It's in the entorhinal, uh, transrhinal cortex at the base of the brain. The rest of the brain does not have any brown, therefore it does not have tangles. It does not have plaques. The tangles and plaques at this stage are only within the dark brown area. At the end of the uh, life of an Alzheimer patient, the brain has spread all uh, of the gray uh, areas of the brain now contain uh, the tangles, the disease neurons with tangles, and the plaques. And uh, the brain function is totally destroyed and the patient uh, dies and we see the results at autopsy. So uh, you can think of this as an escalator phenomenon, spread of infection. It goes from the bottom of the brain, the entorhinal cortex, which is to the left, to the top of the brain, the uh, convexity of the brain, which is to the right at 12 o'clock. Uh, the um, 
escalator idea is a uh, reasonable idea for people to think about spread of disease from the bottom of the brain to the top of the brain. It progresses through a roadmap which is always exactly the same in every patient who has Alzheimer's disease. There are no exceptions. It starts at the bottom and then it goes next to the insular cortex, uh, which are the purple areas. The bottom of the brain is in the red area. And then it terminates at the top of the brain. The orange and the yellow arrows show those. Uh, so the pathway of progression is exactly the same. Every single Alzheimer's patient has exactly the same pattern of disseminated uh, disease. Uh, this to me yells uh, transmission through neural circuits. Transmission jumping across synapses from neuron to neuron. And that's why I believe that it is an intraneuronal infection uh, inside the nerve. It spreads through neural circuit pathways which are anatomically formed at the time of birth in every patient. They're identical. So we have our stages of Alzheimer's disease from the left to the right. And as you can see, there are increase in the number of uh, round uh, plaques, uh, the dark uh, black uh, circular things. Uh, in the late stage, they're very crowded, they're much larger. Uh, the lines are the neurofibrillary tangles. Those are single neurons uh, filled with the black uh, neurofibrillary tangles. So both the tangles and the plaques increase in parallel uh, fashion over the stages of the disease from very early to very late and the time of death. Uh, opportunities for patient care now will be aided by the molecular version of the autopsy. We'll use more DNA probes. We'll look for evidence of infection uh, in all kinds of Alzheimer's disease, even those that are considered to be inherited. Um, and there may be an inherited type that's not related to infection, but we've certainly identified that there is a type that is related to infection. We're going to carve out the infection type and do something about it. Uh, if it's in your genes, there's not too much we can do about it if you have the inherited form of Alzheimer's disease, the disease that runs in families. Uh, we'll study this further and we'll come, to, with, come up with answers to help those who can be helped because infections of the brain, such as dementia of syphilis, which was an infection of the brain, is a curable entity. There is no syphilitic dementia anymore. Uh, after 1945, penicillin eradicated the general paresis dementia, the dementia of late syphilis. There is no syphilitic dementia anymore. Syphilis is spirochete, of course. Syphilis, of course, living in the brain for decades after the initial infection. Syphilis, of course, eradicated by penicillin therapy. There is no more syphilitic dementia. Let us hope we can do something like that for the infectious group of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, remember, we can also do cultures, uh, just as I did in 1986, when I was the first to culture Alzheimer brain and grow pure cultures of Borrelia spirochetes from frozen, thawed Alzheimer brain tissue. At the bottom of the image, you can see a spirochete. It's a snake-like thing. It has little bumps along the way. Those are going to become the granules, membrane-bound, containing DNA. There's a blob up at uh, 1 to 2 o'clock. That is an aggregate of uh, cystic forms of Borrelia. Uh, I described cystic forms of Borrelia in 1988. I found them when I was studying an Alzheimer's brain. The cystic form of Borrelia in the Alzheimer brain in 1988 was attached to an Alzheimer plaque. So there is no accident uh, about my discovery. Uh, cystic forms are now recognized as another legitimate living form of uh, Borrelia spirochetes, just like the snake-like form is real and the granular forms are real. Uh, the net result of Alzheimer's in the worst case, death. And the brain at death shrunken and small compared to the normal brain at the right. So we have campaigns here for public education. The milk people have the Got Milk campaign. Here a celebrity, maybe a Michael Strahan lookalike, his mustache is white, he's taking a glass of milk and the milk is on his mustache. He's happy, milk has helped him. Uh, he believes that milk is a good product for people to take. Here we have our generic everyman who's skeptical about milk. He uh, doesn't have any white mustache like area and his lips 
Uh, so I don't think he drinks milk. He doesn't believe in it. He thinks it's a bunch of uh, hokum. Uh, he, uh, I guess, doesn't uh, get it. We're uh, not going to have a, demand, uh, uh, a got dementia uh, campaign. That would be uh, ethically uh, improper uh, and humanistically wrong to uh, make uh, fun of uh, dementia and to ridicule people who uh, have dementia. That would be not right. But we have to do something about dementia. So we have to have a campaign that will do something about the dementia due to infection that can be dealt with with antibiotics and cured like the dementia of syphilis was cured. We must do something about dementia of Alzheimer's because in 10 to 20 years, the disease will overwhelm the health uh, uh, resources of this country and all the countries of the world. It will bankrupt this nation. There won't be enough young people to take care of all the older people who have Alzheimer's disease if we don't stop it. We can do a great deal to make a dent in the progression of Alzheimer's disease if we can identify the infection subtype and then treat the infection subtype appropriately, stop it in its tracks, or even reverse it. And let those people who are drooling in the soup start to do the New York Times crossword puzzle and uh, you know do uh, productive things with their lives and have good lives with their families. Uh, we're in the diagnostic business. This uh, ends the uh, analysis of uh, the cases that I've studied. So I ask for the next case, please. We have to do some more diagnoses to uh, do our work properly to serve our patients. But the lecture, although it ends here, doesn't end uh, with you. Uh, you are now informed about the infection subtype of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you have been instructed about how to connect the dots. You can see in the right at uh, 4 o'clock uh, the dots that need to be connected to make those dots into uh, an origin from spirochetes. Not all the dots are the same size. Uh, not all the dots are the same uh, in uh, diameter, but they all contain living membrane-bound DNA. Uh, the um, panel to the far left is a pink uh, to red stain. That is biofilm community. Uh, it's uh, from a chronic infection of the skin. Uh, it's not uh, with a DNA probe stain. It's with a special DNA stain for Borrelia proteins. It's done by the work of Dr. Klaus Sendel and Dr. Bernhard uh, Zelger. And uh, it's from Acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans. It's a very late skin infection in uh, a Borrelia disease in Europe. Patients have it for 30, 40 years. Uh, it, the paper, uh, skin turns paper uh, thin, uh, you can see through it. And if you look carefully into the microscope, you can find granular forms of Borrelia burgdorferi in a colony surrounded by a reddish veil. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should because it's a biofilm. A biofilm now demonstrated with protein antibodies, the dark red, the membrane-bound material uh, with the growing living Borrelia inside and then the pinkish material, the veil of pink, the extracellular uh, matrix with Borrelia proteins in the matrix. Uh, we have then uh, finished our discussion of the biofilms, the uh, membrane-bound infectious granular material, the granular Borrelia, the uh, extracellular matrix, the veil that protects it. Uh, you've been fully briefed, and uh, the rest is up to you to spread the word uh, to assist people who are having trouble to get uh, diagnosed, uh, to see if they have the infection type, and to hopefully participate in their recovery. Uh, the content here is, of course, copyright. It should never be sold. It can be freely shared. Um, and this a uh, um, reprise uh, to the 1940s when we had insane asylums. People with various diseases, including dementia, were housed there. They were admitted. Uh, once they got into the hospital, they never got out. When they died, they were buried in uh, cemeteries in the hospital grounds. The uh, hospitals were the size of small cities in the uh, New York metropolitan area and elsewhere in the United States. This is the life they lived. This is the life that Alzheimer's patients live when they're put in nursing homes. Uh, it's not a uh, pretty picture. Uh, we must do something to change this. 
we must do something to carve out the dementia due to infection and eliminate it, just like we eliminated the dementia of syphilis. This is our mission. We must do this. And I uh, really hope that uh, you will take the message to heart and then move to action. So thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. And uh, we'll continue to do research. And we'll partner with you as you move to take action against the infectious form of Alzheimer's disease.